My name is Daniel Adams. I actually have a ministry that is, it's, it's become global. It's called the Supernatural Life. I think there's some forerunners in here, actually. Is there forerunners in here? Okay, there's a few forerunners here, even in the overflow. I see you back there. So welcome, guys. Yeah, I have a global ministry. We have what's called forerunners, uh, and it's all over the world. So like when he's up here saying this, it's just kindred hearts, kindred spirits, um, it's a little bit of a, it's, it's similar vision, uh, a little bit different, but that's the body of Christ, right? That's what we do. Many members, one body. So it's good, though, that we can come together in unity, and I fully support what God is doing here at Hungry Generation. And what's funny is years ago, I came across you guys. I've known you for a long time, longer than you've known me. It, it, yeah, I have. I've been watching you on YouTube for a little while before this whole YouTube thing went off, right? So it's pretty interesting. I'm like, well, here I am. Watched it years ago before I could even get off the ground on YouTube. And I praise God I met him now and not years ago because he might not be my friend now. But <laughs> here we are. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You know, my story, guys, is um, in the eyes of the church, sometimes it's not the most favorable story. But it's a story of brokenness that led to redemption. I was once lost and I was found. Then when I was found, I got lost again, and I got found again. So I got that kind of story. And even as a Christian minister, I got lost and got found again. So praise God, right? <laughs> Amen. Repentance is a real thing, man. But listen, true repentance is what God's looking for. Without true repentance, you'll hit a wall later on. You see what I'm saying? Every time, every time I've tried in my life to do anything with Christ... You know, I, I thought I was surrendered, and I found out I wasn't surrendered, if that makes sense. I'm surrendered. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do, and then I find out there's something there that I had not truly given to Jesus. Small foxes and small compromises that led to big destruction, okay? You know, playing with Delilah here and there and ended up in the lap of the Philistines. You see? So my story is, like I said, interesting. But Jesus. All right. Once again, my name is Daniel Adams. Um, I'm 33 years old. I've been in full-time ministry since 2013. Uh, I actually used to be a cage fighter. That was my dreams and aspiration. So when Jesus called me as a preacher, I said, what? Seriously, man. I was like, hold on, dude. I said, literally, you're like wanting me to like do this preaching deal? Like, I beat people in the face, man. You know? That's what I do for fun. Actually, I wanted to do it for a living. My heart was to be a UFC champion. I'm talking in the days of, like, the GSPs and the Anderson Silvas, you know, those type of things. So, <clears throat> anyway, before I get to that part, just, I, I'm not going to spend a long time on, on this. I want to compress it as much as possible. I hope you catch the meat of what I'm saying. It's just, I'm redeemed through Christ, right? Um, my family, I come from a broken family. My mother and father broke up when I was very young, which let the enemy come into my life full force. I mean, there was a satanic assignment from, from the time that brokenness happened in my family. It came and it was like wild. I mean, I didn't understand the brokenness of family and what it brings in until obviously I went through it as a child and I went through it in my own life. You know, several times until I had to get the generational mess off my life. You see? So I come from a broken place, man. I, um, mom and dad broke up when I was like, I don't know, I think it was 9 or 10. I got actually saved in a Baptist church in 1999, in uh, December of 1999. After the broken thing happened, a Baptist minister was in my uh, house leading me to the Lord. So that was the seed that grew the tree you see today. So I'm thankful for the Baptist church, okay? I'm not against denominations, all right? I wish that they moved a little more powerfully, but God bless them. They put a seed in me that I, I can't deny, amen? So if you got saved in the Baptist church, praise God, you just became Bapticostal, huh? It's all right. <laughs> but I thank God for that moment. Um, then obviously, as you guys know, the same story, teenage years, very rebellious, drugs, women. I never got, I was never a big alcohol guy. I hated that stuff always made me sick. But anyway... I went through, I did the weed thing, all that stuff, you know, ended up getting uh, a girl in high school pregnant who birthed my son. Um, he is today going to be 15 in August, which is amazing. Um, I have him full time. Oh, it is August. I travel a lot, guys. <laughs> 
It's August, so I have a son. He's 15 years old, and actually he was planted in my life too because I believe if he didn't come, you know, God turns the good thing. You know, he's got a weird way of turning the most disgusting things into something good. I mean, in the eyes of, it's called sin, right? Do you know he can make your sin a win? Did you know that? Seriously, man. So I had a child out of wedlock, got married to make it right. Something in me wanted to make it right, then ended up divorced anyway, right? But I had a child, and he, he actually gave me a reason to live. Because I would go into bars and everything, and somebody would run their mouth to me. It, you did, I could get along with anybody, but if I saw somebody talking junk to one of my friends, I would beat that person up. So I was the guy, if my friend couldn't fight, I was there for the little guy. You want to pick on a little guy? I'm going to fight you. That's how I used to be, you know? So I, I would have ended up in jail, dead or something, man, because I just had a lot of rebellion and wanted to fight and stuff. So anyway, that's why I had my son. And then I said to quelch this anger, to quelch this, these emotions. You know, when you go through brokenness and a divorce or something like that, you don't understand a lot of what's going on. You, don't, you, you act in ways and you do things that you, you're like, why am I doing this? And you don't know until the Holy Spirit breathes on it. Even some of you in here today, you have these things happening in your life. And you're going, why is this happening right now? Why am I reacting in this way? Because I love Jesus, but yet this reaction keeps coming up. It's brokenness from the divorce. It's brokenness through, it's, it's, it's the brokenness manifesting that hasn't been healed, you know? But that's the reason for these testimonies, right? So you can get revelation. So light can be shined on it so that the darkness that has been hiding will flee. You see, squatters got to go when they don't own the house. So if Jesus owns your house, all you got to do is let him get in the room and take over, right? He gave you the keys to sin and death. You have, I tell people all the time, they're like, I'm so bound, this demon won't leave me alone. I don't know what to do. I said, you got the keys, man. What? I have the keys? Yes, Jesus took the keys from Satan like a gangster. He came up, he said, hey, bud, the keys. And Satan's like, oh, no. He's like, shut up. Takes the keys. He comes up. I mean, that's what he did, you know. He took the keys. He came up, man, with the keys to sin and death. And guess who he gave them to? You. So if you got a chain on you, if you have something holding you down, you have a key. So no more I don't knows and how do I get free. That, them words, guys, are double-minded words. They're words of doubt and unbelief. What did the man with the, the, the child that was dying, he looked at Jesus and, I mean, uh, or either that was the uh, one that was thrown in the fire or something like that. He goes, help me with my unbelief. You can pray that. Do you know that? Do you know when you feel you're lacking faith, you can rely on Jesus' faith? You catch that? Yeah. I have trouble with doubt. I was even in a house meeting the other day and people were having trouble with doubt. And I said, come, I'm going to pray for you guys because I knew this. Where they doubted, I knew Jesus had enough faith. So if your faith is lacking today, Jesus' isn't. Did you catch that? If you're having trouble with doubt because people didn't believe in you in your life, because fathers didn't instill into your life what, what was supposed to, to, to produce faith, guess what? Today, Jesus is going to produce faith in your life. Young people, today... How the world is quenching faith and pushing things that it shouldn't be pushing. Guess what? Today, Jesus is going to instill his faith into your life. Are you okay with that? Okay. In this service, I have nothing written down either. I, you know, he says, share your story. So I'm letting the Holy Ghost flow. So you guys just got to deal with what comes out my mouth. Psalms 8110, open your mouth. I'll fill it. Fill it, please. <laughs> Amen. So anyway, I became a cage fighter. Ended up meeting my, <laughs> this is going to sound bad, my second marriage and ended up moving to Florida, right? God redeems marriages, guys. Okay, He redeems marriages. He redeems divorced people. He redeems. He's a redeemer, all right? I, I hope that we're in agreement here. <laughs> but this is my story, all right? Devils don't like it. Amen? So I went to, I went to Florida and uh, became a full-time cage fighter. Actually, I had side jobs. I went and did side things like working at Universal Studios as security, doing all these things. Another side note, I used to be a correctional officer for three years. I was dealing with prisoners for three years of my young life at 19 to like 22. So that's another reason I set the captives free. Amen? Usually what you do in your life ends up in your spiritual life. So I'm ex-CO, ex-cage fighter, ex-sheriff's deputy. Here you go, right here. 
So if he can use me, <laughs> yeah, he can use you. Trust me. So, yeah, I ended up down there pursuing um, cage fighting and, and, and really going after it. I trained with some of the most famous people you see on TV today, you know, um, and got hit in the face a lot, hit in the head a lot. Yeah, so when persecution comes, hitting me ain't going to work. They're going to have to probably kill me, you know, because I'm okay with being hit. Being knocked out ain't that bad. It actually feels like you've slept a long time, so it's no problem, man. <laughs> You know, you'll be all right. Trust me, guys. It's not as bad as it seems. So, anyway, yeah, I um, did that for a while. And during that, now listen, here's where the seed from 1999 comes into place, right? Into play. I noticed when I said yes to Jesus as a child at 1999. And also Jesus before that seed brought a thought to me. When I was a young, young, young lad, man, I mean young child, right? Probably around like five years old. He reminded me that I said a prayer to him. You know the pray, prayer I said as a five-year-old boy when my mom was trying to push me to be a lawyer and everything else? I said, Jesus, make me a pastor. I didn't know what. He reminded me. He brought that to remembrance that moment. And, you know, I was like, who says that prayer? I didn't even know what that was at five years old well now I do know and I know that it takes a lot of dying to do these things you know what I'm saying but anyway I said that prayer and then I noticed in 1999 when I got that seed in my heart up to that point when I was a cage fighter people wouldn't leave me alone even in prison when I was a CEO about Jesus man he kept tormenting me you hear that the devil was already he didn't have to torment me Jesus said, I'm going to torment you till you say yes to him. You know why? There's a verse in the Bible that says, nobody can pluck them from my hand. Did you hear that? If you're given to Jesus, if you've given yourself to him, he will always snatch you back. I've tried to run from Jesus several times in my walk, even as a minister. That dude won't leave me alone, man. He won't. He always says, hey, you made a deal with me. I hold my end of the bargain now. Hold yours. And I'm like, oh, you're right. You're going to remind me. He will remind you until you come back. He will put walls and things in front of you that break your legs. And then he'll pick you up and bring you right back, man. You know, that's how the shepherds got the sheep. He broke their legs and brought them back. It's so awesome, man. So I broke my legs and I came back. Right? He's so good some of you may feel far from him today you might be like is there really a way back is there is there really a way to to be forgiven of this sin is there i can't stop it i just continue it over and over and over and you guys got a great pastor here that teaches on the flesh crucifying the flesh versus the demonic bondage in your life right so don't keep blaming yourself for something you got to get out of you Okay, if you got a demonic issue, just say, hey, I got a demonic issue. Because, it, because what happens is pride will come in and cover the demonic issue and say, you can beat it. You can beat it. You can beat it. You can beat it. Because the last thing the enemy wants you to do is to humble yourself and say, I need whatever it takes, man. I lose dignity for the sake of Christ. The key to freedom, guys, is humility, which means no dignity. You can, but you, David danced in his loincloth, man. He became undignified. When you are in the presence of the Lord, when you truly, trust me, church, when you truly surrender to Jesus, you lose dignity. You don't care who's next to you. You don't care who sees you. You don't care what kind of substances come out of your body. You don't care if it's on camera, man. You say, look, if this is a testimony for the world, use me, set me free, make me look like a nut. Seriously. You got to look. Guys, if you want to be used by Jesus, let me tell you something. If you don't become undignified now, he will undignify you later. You hear that? He chastises those he loves. If you don't lose dignity now, I'm speaking from experience. He will make sure you're exposed in a way that you can never get that dignity back. <laughs> you get it? I got a mark on my life. 
I got a stain on me that will now never allow me, and I'm perfectly fine in some people's eyes to get the dignity back, but I like it. You know why? Because Jesus used flawed vessels, man, for his glory. And you know there's not no but one perfect. His name is Jesus, man. Nobody can steal that perfection from him. And look... Because he has been perfected, guess what that says about you? That you have been too. If you surrender and say yes to him, you receive his perfection. You receive his holiness. You receive his righteousness. You receive his purity. You want to know how to be holy as he is holy? Accept that he is holy in your life. You want to know, you say, how do I be righteous? You can't be righteous in your own works. They're nothing but filthy rags, man. But you can be righteous in the fact that he died for you. You can be righteous in the fact that he's given you his Holy Spirit and you can now proceed forth in that righteousness. Do you see it? It's simple as saying, I receive it. That's it. And if you truly receive it and you remove the walls of doubt and unbelief, there's something called the power of the Holy Ghost that will get all over you and wreck you for eternity. Amen. So, let it be, right? Now listen, I was um, doing the cage fighting thing, and then I had this weird fascination all my life with this demonic realm. I used to watch Dragon Ball Z. I thought I could be a Super Saiyan, you know what I'm saying? I thought I could like get to Super Saiyan 5 and I'd fly. I literally, when I was a little boy, used to stand outside and try to fly. I used to shoot orbs of power out of my want to shoot orbs of power out of my hands and so I was crazy back then man I really thought I was going to be a real life superhero right I didn't realize when you accepted Jesus you do become a superhero for him right it's crazy it's true some of you used to say I want to be like Superman and Batman and all these things guys be like Jesus he's the best superhero man you know Ain't nothing better than seeing a demon scream because the power of the Holy Spirit is moving through you. And we don't rejoice. Now listen, we don't rejoice because they scream. We rejoice that our name is written in the book of life, right? But there's still, hey, there's still something about it when they have to bow to the name of Jesus, man. That, if anything would save you, it should be the satisfaction of knowing that those demons are scared, man. If the darkest force, listen. If the darkest force in the world, his name is Satan, right, is scared of Jesus, what's our problem? He knows something, right? And if he's kneeling and trembling, then we should be too, but in a different way. We kneel in awe, we kneel in honor, we kneel in reverence of who he is and what he's done. That's the difference for us. We can simply go, you're good enough. You're wonderful. You're precious. You're holy. We can do those things instead of going, ah, don't burn me later. You know what I'm saying? See, the demons are like, don't do it. Don't send me to the pit. The abyss. Oh, no. No, don't put the fire of God on me. Not the angels again. I don't like that. That's how they do, man. That's how demons are. We shouldn't be that way. We invite the angels. We invite his holy presence. We invite the fire of the Lord. Right? It's an, we get to invite him anytime. You know, simply, some people say, I don't feel the presence of the Lord. Did you invite the presence of the Lord? Did you acknowledge it? Are you aware of it? Are you praying without ceasing? Are you in constant awareness that he's near you? Seriously, man. You can be in constant awareness, and his presence is always near. Wonderful, right? Okay. So as a cage fighter, I'm putting some preaching in between for you guys. <laughs> That's what I do, right? I was a cage fighter, and then I started to go through my life. So this is where the, the process starts, right? 1999, became a cage fighter. Abraham moment, out of my homeland to a land I don't know. You know, when God wants to do something with you, he's not going to let you stay in what you're used to. He's going to move you into a place where it's going to require risk and faith. If he's going to use you, he has to get you away from what you're familiar with. If Abraham would have stayed in that land, he would have stayed like the rest of his family. But God moved him away from his family so that he could hear the voice of his true father who gave him promise. And you were a result of Abraham's promise. Huh? Amen. So there's a promise in your life that you will receive if you'll make the move, man. If you'll go, I'm going from here. Okay, Lord, you said go there. Well, what about this? Finances, my home, all these things, my family. What about mommy and daddy if they don't make it and they die? No, move. 
see the result. You know, that's the thing with faith. I love faith, man. Faith requires radical moves. Faith requires you to do crazy things. I was in a cloud of witnesses upstairs just a minute ago. Smith Wigglesworth is there. He would kick babies and take dead bodies out and make crazy things happen, right? Today, we're scared to do that because we don't want to go to jail. Oh, he's going to kick the baby. Don't kick the baby. Child, here, it comes, here comes DCF. Here comes all the mess. You know, that's the way we think, though. The enemy instills fear when Jesus said only believe, right? We're getting back to that church. You know, there's a day coming where two witnesses will be about, right? Breathing fire and doing crazy signs and wonders, man. So, you know, we might as well get it right now. Okay, so cage fighter, I started to get passionate about deliverance. I started to see videos and stuff on YouTube, even at 2013. I, YouTube is this weird place that Jesus uses, man, to pull people in. Half of you in church now because of YouTube. You know, you saw somebody getting delivered from a demon by a minister, and you're like, oh, I want to, what's that? <laughs> and you're like, oh. and then you get in a place where it's real, and you're like, oh, this is real. So that's that thing that used to press me down on my bed at night. Wow. Interesting. It's actually real. Yeah, it's not. It's not just like something you ate. No, it's real, dude. <laughs> you know? So that's what I did. I started watching YouTube and stuff. I caught fire. And the desires and the ministry upon my life started to manifest. After that happened, I had a deliverance minister. I ended up putting actually cage fighting away when that stuff started to become real in my life. I surrendered. Right? I was in my room. The, ba the same Bible in 1999 that I got when I was baptized. Guess where that Bible was? Collecting dust on my shelf. I picked that same Bible from 1999. It was NIV. Don't nobody judge me. I put it down. I opened it up. I started reading it in the presence of God. From his word. Just reading. Listen. Just reading his word. His word started to transform my heart. He made my heart go from stone, the process of going to flesh. What was in that word was starting to get written upon my heart. <clears throat> and I started to manifest it, man. I went from that point one day I was reading, and I said, I got to look up a worship song on YouTube. What do I do? I go sit in front of the computer. I hit the computer. I typed in, like, Jesus song, right? Here's this song from Jeremy Camp called This Man with this video and this Jesus on the cross, the crucifixion of Christ. Sitting there, I look and I see this man hung across a cross, bleeding and bruised and all messed up. And I remember as I watched that, these things started coming out of my eyes to call tears. And then more of them came. More of them came. And I started to wail under the power of Jesus Christ and that sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. I understood the cross. You see? And then it all started. I went from there. The Lord started to bring supernatural people into my life. Because I become hungry for the supernatural. People that were teaching me about deliverance. I was under a deliverance minister for like a year and a half. Not even filled with the Holy Spirit. Just learning. The deliverance minister met me actually in the gym as a personal trainer. I'm in 24-hour fitness. Top trainer in the gym. There's a girl in the gym that says, I know this deliverance minister. Here comes the deliverance minister. Drops this huge thing of books. And I take all these books home and start reading them. And I'm like... Wow, and I start going to his meetings and I start seeing people get free and stuff, and I'm like, this is like so real. And then after that, the old man comes to my house because he's an older gentleman and lays hands on me and says, Holy Spirit, fill him, and nothing happened. I left there a little disappointment. I was like, why didn't I get filled with the Holy Spirit? You know? I had a lot of pride though. You know, when you're a cage fighter, you're prideful, right? And then after that, I remember I went home and got into my shower. Now listen. People will lay hands on you sometimes and the result might come later. You know that, right? It ain't always what you think. See, we come with these like weird, like I want God to do what I want him to do because I'm in control of God. God's not in control of me. You see that? What happened to me is I expected fireworks, fire from heaven for me to burn, baby, burn. Nothing happened, man. And I went home and I got in my shower and I remember I started to get a little upset and I said, Lord, maybe tongues and stuff ain't for me. And then as the water was on me, I noticed the water got a little bit hotter. And I said, I didn't turn the knob. 
And I said, something's going on in this thing, man. Then I got this tingly feeling. And my tongue started, uh, da, 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 da. and I said, what is this? <laughs> and all of a sudden, just, it just came all the way out, man. I remember my, my ex at the time, she goes, what is that? I said, that's the Holy Ghost, man. He got me in my shower, man. <laughs> he did. In the most vulnerable moment. Ain't that something? He got me, I hope this is okay. He got me butt naked in the shower, man. Like I'm out of the, out of the baby's womb again, you know? Could have got me anywhere. And I'm just on fire with water on me. You catch on fire with water on me. <laughs> it made no sense, you know? It sounds like Elijah when he put water on the thing and then the fire comes and it still goes, right? It's crazy, man. It had, but he had to do that to burn all that stuff out of me, you know? So anyway, I go from that, man. I'm on fire. I live an on-fire life. I, was a tr I had my own personal training gym at this time. There's a Jehovah Witness woman next to me. I pr her client comes in and is like, I need prayer. And I'm like, I'll pray for you. And she goes, oh, and hits the ground, right? She gets up and she's like, she's like, hey, Jehovah Witness lady, this guy next door prayed for me. And the Jehovah Witness is like, yeah, this is emotional manipulation, you know? She tells the landlord. The landlord comes up to me and says, you can no longer be in this building. And it started. I went from full-time jobs to full-time ministry. That was the day. That was the day that jobs, that type of job stopped for me. I mean, I've worked other things, but full-time work was over after that. Because you know what I said? I said, Lord, you've shut this door of all my desires, of all my wants. Because I went in 2000, I think it was around 11, 12, somewhere around there. I can't quite remember. And I remember I looked up to the sky. Be careful what you say to Jesus. And I said this. I said, listen, Jesus. I said, my desires have faded. I can no longer go and be a cage fighter now. I, because I don't have the passion. I can't put myself in a place to beat people to a bloody mess anymore. You know? And I said, I don't really know what to do in life. I said, your dreams are all I have. So here is my dream. See? Here is my Isaac. Here is everything and more. Take it. Take it all, Lord. And use me. Use me. Give me wisdom. I need it. I said that. Said that. And I remember after that, I would go in the back of my house and I would try to get caught up to the third heaven and everything. I'd lay on the ground for like three hours just in obedience and I'd get in trees because I thought I heard a voice say, go get in the tree. <laughs> I did this stuff, man. I was wild. I wanted everything and more, man. That was my life. I become like a child again, literally. I would, tell, I would say, hey, here's the baby. I'm going out here. And I'd go outside because I couldn't wait to just sit in a tree. Seriously, man. And look up and be like, oh, I'm going to see this, this shooting star. It's going to be like an alien or something up there, dude. I'm just looking around. It's going to happen today, you know. And after I said that prayer, guys, and I did those little things, that is when my life became crazy, man. Demons manifesting in people's life. Just, just showing up, man. You know, getting cussed out for no reason. I remember I used to chase people down and want to pray for them, and they want to pull guns on me and shoot me. I'm like, whoa, relax. I'm just trying to pray for you, homie. Because I, I, I would go I would go down alleyways to pray for people, man. One time there was a woman walking down the road in 2013 with a walker. I remember I parked in the median, got out of my car, and chased her down to pray for her, man. Looking back, I'm like, what? What, what, what was that? But when you learn about Jesus, man, when you learn about what he can do, you don't care anymore. You don't care. You're just like, I'll do whatever it takes, Lord. I just want to serve you. That's it. And then after that happened, this dream come into my life. I had a dream where I saw America in shambles. Buildings were destroyed. There was a huge cargo plane. People were loading onto it. I was standing with a friend in the dream, and I was like, wow, what happened to this place? Like, it was messed up. And then a, a military guy comes up to me in the dream and says, people are going to Jerusalem. I said, what are they going to Jerusalem for? And I remember in the third person, it shifts to Jerusalem. And I look up, and I see the clouds swirling. And this foot comes through the cloud. It's wild, like bronze foot. And I'm like, what is that? 
And here he comes out of the clouds. And I'm like, whoa, majestic, man. I mean, on another level. Out of the clouds, swirling clouds. He comes down. I watch the foot touch this Mount of Olives. Boom. He walks down the mount. He gets into the third temple. The third temple is built, right? I remember seeing him. He had this crown on, this sash, this wonderful, glorious white robe, and this bronze skin, this beautiful beard. Kind of reminded me of the picture of Achan that she wrote. Some of you guys might know what I'm talking about. Walks down, walks into the temple, sits on, the mer- sits on that seat. A big, big granite, huge, like, throne. I don't even know how to, marble or something, you know? And the dude sits on it like, mm, and like this huge shock wave goes through the world, and I woke up. And I said, what in the world was that? You know, I hadn't read enough of the Bible to really understand what was going on. I didn't understand the dude was like literally going to probably come back in these ways, you know? It says the way he ascended is the way he will descend. And I was like, whoa, this is crazy. After that, souls started coming. <laughs> After that dream, man, I became a soul winner. Seriously, it's wild. You know, a dream from God can change your life forever. All it takes is the right dream, guys. Do you believe in the dreams that God has given you? No, I'm serious. Do you understand the capacity that you have in Christ? Do you know that the devil does not like you? And the last thing he wants you to do is become a dreamer and to actually believe that God wants to use you. You know, he wants to fight against that as much as he can. He wants to make you feel like you're so much not made in the image of God. Do you know that? He wants to distort everything about you. He wants to bring you into the deepest, darkest places. He wants you to put into some of the biggest ditches of guilt, shame, and condemnation. Bear with me, guys. I'm getting towards the end, right? Big, biggest places of guilt, shame, and condemnation. So you'll never go, I'm worthy. You understand? That is not where we want to be. Okay? A dream. If you'll hold on to the dream, if you'll believe it, if you'll write it down and make it plain, Habakkuk 2.2, 2, you'll see it manifest. Okay? Trust me, it'll happen, man, but you just got to keep believing. Consistency. You have to be consistent. You need to walk through the battles. You have to win them. And if you win them, Jesus will show you greater. And you'll go from glory to glory and faith to faith, man. You have to win. Even if it feels like you've lost, you really haven't. Did you catch that? Because what happens is we lose a battle and we forget Jesus won the war. So just because you had a moment of defeat, doesn't mean you're defeated. Just because you had a moment of a sinful moment doesn't mean that that loss is not going to become a win and a greater testimony. It's up to you. Amen? So I had that dream, and then I had another dream not too long after that, after I was doing ministry and stuff. I'm really compressing and trying to give you guys as much as I can. I had a dream that I was on America's Funniest Home Videos. There was TVs all around me, and, the, and, and this guy, Gene Bergeron, comes and sits. He's the host at the time. I know he was representing Jesus, and he goes, hey, Daniel. I said, what's up, man? He said, you see all these TVs around you? I said, yeah. He said, I don't want you to use no TVs. I said, all right. And he looks, and he points his finger in my face, and he says, use the Internet. I said, use the Internet? And I woke up, and I said, what is that? I told everybody. They thought it was just, oh, it's a pizza dream. I said, What? I said, Holy Spirit, what is this? He said, Daniel, you need to use the internet. Then I get on YouTube and I see these ministers. Like, there's ministers. Like, uh, there's, there's, I come across, like, Todd White. At the time, he was very popular in 2013. He was out there really evangelizing. And a few other ministers' names that were really getting into the YouTube game. And I said, you know, I'm going to do this. And I went out with my phone just like this. Hear me, church. I went out my phone... <laughs> Like this, I had no camera like I have now or anything. And I started to record every testimony. I found a friend to go with me. You want to go pray for people? Uh, yeah, let's go. You know, we'd go. I say, hold the camera. And I just started my YouTube channel just like that. That's how I started. And then in two, I started that in 2015, man. I had the dream around 2014, 2013. And then 2015, I started my YouTube channel. And I went, started from that point on, I'm going to really condense it now. From the point of understanding my call and destiny, I started to go through the toughest process I think I'd ever been through in my whole life. So I'm going to end that part of the testimony there. And I'm just going to tell you, 
it got pretty hot. <laughs> because then what happens is when you understand the call and destiny and you say yes to it and you say you're going to walk into it, the next thing God does is refine you. And you go into a refinement process. See, everybody wants to do ministry. I want to be a great YouTuber. I want to be a great preacher. I want to do all these things. I want to travel the world. Me, I thought I was going to be in crusades doing a lot of things. It didn't look like that, guys. Okay, now I'm equipping the body of Christ for the works of ministry, right? That's great. I'm called more to that. But I will do crusades. I have no problem with that. But we all have big dreams, big vision. And we think that when we get it, the next day it's going to be there. Don't work like that. God is going to make sure that you have been chipped down to, to nothing. You, you are, he is the potter, you the clay. And he takes beauty from ashes, right? You got to become broken, man. You got to come to nothing. You got to come to the end of yourself to be at the beginning of God. You hear that? You got to come to the end of yourself to be at the beginning of God. And because of my not surrendering in my process I went through more damage pain and hurt and trauma man I've been a man I have I have suffered in my life because of the brokenness of divorce when I was a child I had two divorces in my life I hate divorce I hate it it's destructive it's nasty I hate Jezebel I hate her she's nasty I, I hate Satan himself that's something you can hate you can hate him he is a hateful nasty serpent you see, I suffered because of brokenness early in my life. I now got to, I, I then watched my children suffer. You see, so even in ministry, I went through some stuff, guys. But you know what it was? It was my refusal. I'm being transparent. Is transparency okay? My refusal to deal with the small foxes. It ain't the big things. It's the little things, guys. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. You know, I loved your teaching on Delilah, Pastor Vlad, because I understand it so well. You know? Guys, pornography will kill you. I'm going to convict every person in this room with the Holy Ghost, man. Because you know what? The church is full of pornography. Seductive spirits. Why are we seeing so many... You know, we, we cast demons out of so many people. I travel the world. That spirit of seduction is everywhere. That seducing spirit is at work more. People manifest like snakes and, and all these things because they're just eating that seductive fruit of the enemy, man. We need to repent, man. I suffered, guys. I watched the gradual decline to destruction. This is my testimony, man. Don't play with the devil's fruit. Don't, man. I got ridiculed, pure persecuted by the church. I've been through stuff that you, some people would commit suicide over. I don't know how I didn't commit suicide through the brokenness of my life. You see, I understand, man. I understand pain. I understand hurt. But I also know the Redeemer. His name is Jesus Christ. Do you understand? Jesus gave me a third shot, man. He said, Daniel, are you really ready to surrender? I said, Lord, I said, I've lost it all. My children are jacked. I'm jacked. I've seen too much divorce and destruction. Jezebel was literally in my house destroying me. What else can I do, man? I said, I'm just going to sit at home to eat ice cream and play video games. Because I was sick of church, man sick of it I was sick of the hypocrisy I was sick of the judgment I was sick of a lot of things man and then Jesus showed me he said why are you looking at them and not looking at me it's true he said that's the whole point of the church Daniel for judgment and hypocrisy so we can heal them and deliver them I said you're right I'm a hypocrite just like them because I'm judging them I feel like a victim you know victimization will run you into sin too if you view yourself from a victim mindset, you're going you're gonna to be around victimized people, man. You know, and, they, and they'll keep making you a victim. You're no longer victims. You're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Huh? And now let me, let me tell you, let me tell you about redemption. Can I tell you redemption? Most churches don't want nothing to do with me because of my story. I'm just going to be real. I was, I was like, Pastor Vlad, do you really want me? Because I'm okay just being out in the, 
You know, I'll just stay in the harvest field, do meetings. You know, we usually do our own meetings and stuff because, you know, anyway, we ain't going to talk about denominations. But, any, you know, I was like, you sure you want me in here, man? And I and, and my wife was like, man, he must have, he really hurts the Holy Spirit, doesn't he? I said, hey, I hope he must. He wants to be my friend. <laughs> you know? You know, I, I love that I'm a friend of Jesus. You know? I hope that my story is really helping some of you guys. I really do. Let me tell you what happened after that moment. I remember when I went through that sinful moment of my life and I felt the presence of the Lord depart. The Holy Spirit never left, but the presence, it can become very absent. I even took on a weird doctrine and everything, guys, when I was in that seductive part of my life. I forgot repentance, this greasy, nasty grace stuff. You know, I just, grace that didn't empower change, grace that relate. You know what I'm saying? When I said, you know, Jesus, if you give me one more chance, I'll make sure you're glorified in everything. I will become the father I'm supposed to be. Oof. It still hits me, man. And I'll become the husband that you want me to be. Um, he's, he's good. I, uh, I just know his goodness. I'm an example of the goodness of God, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I'm getting emotional, but I was, I remember I sat there that day and I remember, I remember when the presence of God came onto me on a couch, I wept. I've never shared my testimony this way since that season. This is the first time me really releasing it this way. I wept in the presence of God, came back upon me, and he said, Daniel, thanks for letting me back. I said, man, thank you, man. Thanks for remembering me is what he said. I said, I'm sorry I forgot you. And every feeling I had in 2013 when I got filled with the Holy Ghost came back to me, man. And I said, I will serve you the rest of the days of my life. And I will give the devil a headache as long as I live. Until the day I die and there's no breath in my lungs, I will make sure the devil is tormented. And today, God has trusted me again with a wonderful ministry. He gave me a beautiful, beautiful, amazing, laid down wife, man. He did. She takes my kids. If you guys see her with my kids, she takes them like they're her own. I couldn't, I don't know. I don't know how that happens, man. I was so jacked, man. And God just restored it all. I went to my ex, exes, and I took the responsibility. You know, men, let me tell you something. Stop blaming the women for your problems, man. Stop it. The women are not your problem. You are. In ministry, why are we seeing the women on fire and the men ain't around? What's going on, man? You know what it is? We're still laying in the bed with that stuff. Your wife's not your problem, man. That's your church. That's your first church. If she's not taken care of, nothing will be. You understand? You have dreams and desires, men of God. Take care of your family, man. Take care of your family. Get the devourer out of your life, man. Put down the problems. Put down those pornographic stuff. Put down the lust and perversion, man. It's destroying you, man. It, it is. It's destroying you. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to lose everything if you keep playing with that. Everything. You're going to lose it all. I mean, that's just true. I'm not trying to scare anybody. It just, it's just how Satan works. Satan gets a buyout. Give me my payout. You played with that too long. Give it here. You can't play with her anymore. It's okay. I can keep doing this. I mean, uh, it's just a moment. I can I, watch this. This is a big one. I confess to my wife. What? But you're still going and doing it even after you confess. That's 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 a that's such a lie. I used to do the same thing. Hey, I messed up. I just keep because I wasn't truly repentant. You got to learn to hate it, man. You have to hate that thing, and then you have to be delivered from it, man. You do. Look. My opinion, my opinion, okay? I'm not saying this is absolute truth. Anybody that I've ever seen give in to pornography instantly gets demons, man. I've seen it. It's The statistic is too high. 
You sleep with somebody when you do that. You're, uh, mm, uh, uh, I used to feel that spirit come on me. <sighs> you know? And that my days were destroyed. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm looking at you. Some of you are like, man, why is he talking about this? What service did I come to? Oh, good gosh almighty. It's my testimony. I hope today some of you are going to truly surrender now and stop playing games with the little foxes, the addictions, the things that are hurting you, killing you, stealing from you. John 10.10, 10, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus brings life. You know, even, even, even ministers, man, suffer with this. And they, so many of them even look at me and think they're tricking me. You're not tricking me. You can't trick somebody that used to be a trick. Huh? You can't manipulate an ex-manipulator. Huh? You can't deceive somebody that was deceived. You know, people will say, and th- say things to me, and they will just straight up keep lying. They will lie. They will hold it. And I look at them, and I'm like, man, if this isn't me you're lying to. Tell them it's the Holy Spirit. And they'll leave with the same line. Their life goes straight to hell, literally. Because they don't realize it isn't me that they're lying to. It doesn't mean they're deceiving. Just tell the truth. Be transparent. Be real, guys. You know why I preach this way now? Because Jesus is returning. He's coming back for a pure and spotless bride. And we are in the season. I'm going to preach about this next. Of the church being commissioned into her divine destiny. There is no more pew setting, man. That's over with. You don't get to sit in the pews anymore. A quiet church is a dying church. The thing I love about this church is they commission people into their destinies. They're raising up the next generation. They're investing in people. I can honor a church like that. This is church. This is fivefold ministry. If you're in this city, if you got friends and family, I would say come to this church. And I'm not just saying that. I don't have to promote anything. But I will promote where Jesus is at. And he is in this house. The worship to the the people, the honor, the the humility. This is where Jesus lives. In Pasco, Washington, if revival was to break out, and it is, it's here. I'm serious. It's here, man. Why Pasco, Washington? I never heard of that in my whole life. I'm like, Pasco, Washington? You know, I didn't even realize the Ukrainian population and Russian population up here. I was like, this is crazy. What a great place for revival. I walk outside, it looks like I'm in the Sahara Desert. I'm like, this is great. Why wouldn't Jesus do it here? If you live here, listen to me. And honor. if you're in another church, I understand. Honor the church, but don't stay in a dead place, man. Go where Jesus lives. Go where he's glorified. Go where he can be honored. This is a place of that.